Okay, hello! I'm excited to do this video here today talking about evidences proving the truth of the coming of Christ. And that line there comes from 2 Nephi 11 verse 4 that says, Behold, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. That's Nephi speaking there. And so, you know that I've made many videos talking about gifts of the Spirit, how we can grow in receiving revelation. This video takes a different tone, um, where I look at evidences that can help support our faith. Just as Alma told Korahor, we have all the planets and we have all these things that are evidences of there being a supreme creator. And I think it's important that while it is true that we can have many experiences with God through the Holy Ghost speaking to our mind and our heart, and there are many other manifestations of the Spirit, including gifts of the Spirit like miracles or receiving revelations, inspired dreams, wisdom, knowledge, healings, and the list goes on and on, and um, receiving grace to allow us to have divine attributes beyond our normal ability, uh, receiving guidance. There's all these ways that we can know the truth. We can receive all these experiences and develop a testimony that way. I think it is important to emphasize that there is so much evidence indicating that it is true that Jesus Christ came to this earth. So, and, and I, the one of the issues is that as we raise people in the church, as we teach our children about the gospel, we can emphasize so much having these experiences with God that we forget to point out all the readily available evidence that Jesus Christ came to the earth. And in doing so, sometimes uh, I think we can, we can yield some ground over to our... Um, I wouldn't want to call enemies, but people who are opponents to us in this argument over the truthfulness of God, because they say, well, we base our claims off evidence, and you base your claims off of your feelings, right? But I would just tell you, a testimony is much more than feelings. Of course, there are miracles that still occur today, and we have miraculous experiences with God. But in addition to that, we also have a lot of evidence, too. Um, I want to point out here, I have been finishing up a book of my own spiritual experiences, and this is the cover here, My Testimony of Jesus Christ, a collection of experiences. I've been giving out copies to some friends and family, but you can look forward to seeing that um, shared in the, hopefully, the near future. Um, and I want to read for you this verse here. Um, this is the words of the Lord as recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, saying, For I am God, and mine arm is not shortened, and I will show signs, I will show miracles, signs, and wonders unto all those who believe on my name. Right? He doesn't say he'll show them unto some who believe on his name. He says he'll show them unto all who believe on his name. And he doesn't say he may show miracles, signs, and wonders. It says that he will show them. So as it says in DNC 82.10, you know, I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. Um, if we fulfill the principles that he's given us, we will see signs in our lives that will show the truthfulness to us. And I have recorded some of my precious experiences in this book, My Testimony of Jesus Christ, a collection of experiences. But yeah, without further ado, let's jump into some of the hard evidences that are here right before our eyes that you could maybe even say don't even require exercising much faith. They're just there available for us. So the first one, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So if we look, right, you may be familiar with the story. Um, we read in Genesis, um, Genesis 19, I think, talks about the destruction. Genesis 19, but in 13, it talks about, and there's other references that talk about the location of this city, uh, Sodom. And then there was Gomorrah. But it says, Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of Jordan. It was well watered. Um, and yeah, this is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But that's where Sodom was, was on this plain near Jordan. 
um, and it was well watered. And it turns out um, this is just a recent development, um, but in the early year 2000, so just about two decades ago, there were some people who got an agreement with the government to begin excavating a site where they believed what could be one of the locations where Sodom was located because it was the largest city in this particular area. Um, they said that due to all the past warfare, there were landmines and there were things that would stop them from doing this excavation project, project but they were able to move forward. And just recently, in year uh, 2021, September 2021, there's this amazing paper published showing all this evidence. And basically, right, you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that the Lord rained down fire and brimstone from heaven, or laid, rained down fire and destroyed the city. Well, guess what? You can look here that it turns out that the ancient city that was located here was destroyed by a meteorite impact, that they, a meteorite or a cosmic airburst. And they, they talk about this. You can look at articles in the Smithsonian, too, or in Forbes. But summarizing some of the findings from this article published in Nature, which is a very reputable magazine. But basically, a meteor impact, a meteor was coming down, and as it traveled through the atmosphere, it became extremely hot, and it broke apart and created this extremely hot, fiery impact that destroyed the city. And um, I would encourage you, you can read the paper for yourself. Um, this tung, uh, Tunguska, that, is a, that refers to a meteor strike that occurred um, in Siberia where a much smaller meteor came down, but it was still very powerful. And as it traveled through the atmosphere, it exploded and it created a fire burst of superheated gas that came down and it burned up several, like several hundred reindeer and the, the herders who were herding these reindeer, it just killed them, the fire that came down from heaven. And the blast was so powerful, it knocked down um, hundreds and hundreds of trees. So all the trees, they're just stripped of their leaves and just flattened. There might be images of that here. Um, but I'll, I'll show you some things in this paper. So they're talking about the location right um tal el haman that's this location where they believe sodom was and it was you know how it was destroyed by fire from heaven um and so this is their site where they've been digging you know it's it's buried down under the ground here um and i was watching a video of some people who were digging at the location and there's some super more Near the surface, there's the Iron Age time period, but then you go down further to the Bronze Age, which is about 1000 to 3000 BC, the time of Sodom. And there's the there's these cities, and the crazy thing is they were, um, you can see that it was destroyed by this fiery meteor impact. And some of the things you'll see are um, the people who were living there the blast was so powerful, it disarticulated their skeletons. So it ripped their bones apart. Their skeletons aren't like laying down together, but it, it ripped their bodies apart. And there's fragments of burnt bones buried in the ground because it was so hot, it burned through the people and then it burned their bones as well. Not only did it burn people in their bones, but um, it was so powerful that it burnt clay and pottery. Uh, let me find some pictures for you of that. Which one's this here? Yeah, you can read through the paper and just... Oh yeah, these are pottery fragments that they were just shattered by the blast. And you'll see locations where they were melted or their bricks, that the bricks and the clay melted and flowed down over other objects and then solidified. Um, they do some electron microscope scans. Um, and so this is talking about diamond uh, diamonds that were formed and it's a classic thing people look for for meteor strikes because the meteors come down with so much heat and impact they heat up the carbon in the area to such a degree that it forms microscopic diamonds and they believe because of how quartz was melted in this location and how pottery was melted and 
these other things that occurred that the temperature here i think they say it was over a thousand degrees like it was two i think it was two thousand degrees they're saying that it got to here so extremely hot temperatures um they also talk about in this paper how when the u.s did some atomic bomb testing i think they did an atomic bomb in new mexico or something they put the atomic bomb on a tower and they lit it off and the the heat was so much that it heated the sand of the desert below and it made small beads of glass little spheres of glass out of the sand and they have the same thing here these little pieces of uh, like little microscopic spheres of glass formed as things got so hot oh well, here's like pottery that it just got burned to pieces by this intense heat and they they do the analysis demonstrating how hot it must have been and they take pieces of pottery into these firing chambers where they heat them up to over a thousand degrees to test how hot does pottery have to get to undergo these changes to try and estimate the heat that was there uh, melted mud bricks um let's see what else they talk about anyway you can read this um they just have it and what so they just have all this evidence that there is a city here in the location that matches sodom and it's the right time period and it was destroyed by fire from heaven and it came down in oh yeah shocked quartz indicating the high pressures that were there um this is a really long paper, as you can see. Um, just want to make sure I don't miss something that's particular. Oh, this is, I think, the spheres of glass. Um, Silica-rich spheres, because, right, silica, you make glass out of that. Um, yes. But basically, they talk about how on planet Earth, right, we have it's expected that we'll have a meteor strike every couple thousand of years every couple thousand years that could take out a, a major human settlement and um oh is this the burnt bones yeah they look at the different bones that are buried there and it it was a sudden event and what they talk about too is if you look at the layers you can see the layers that have built up gradually over time but when you get to this event with the fire that came down from heaven and just incinerated and blasted the city and melted clay and pots and just yeah just incinerated the city um no one there's a gap in the time period for about 700 years and what actually happened they say is that the blast was so powerful that it it went into the surrounding area and it caused salt from the nearby dead sea to get sloshed up over the the region which made the soil infertile so not only could people not um like it destroyed all the people there but it put all this salt in the area and because people grew barley and wheat now the soil was all salty they couldn't grow food there so it le left the whole land desolate and it's also interesting that lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt um in the in genesis but and you know the romans they would when they would conquer areas sometimes they would plow salt into the fields so that they couldn't grow food and it would be a way of weakening those those territories but what's what's so crazy about this is the timeline that we have the biblical record that's been around four thousands of years you know the oldest thing we have is the dead sea scrolls which date to before jesus christ indicating you know that these records have been around since before jesus christ but this is where some people, based on what the Bible said, went looking to find Sodom to see if they could find this city. And they were able to find it in year 2000 because these restrictions had lifted up and they got permission from government leaders. And they go in and they dig down and they find a city that was destroyed by a meteorite strike. Um, this is an update that was published this year in 2023 about the 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 airburst destroying the, the middle-aged bronze city in jordan valley near the dead sea and they had this um they used a supercomputer to do this like calculation of what would happen if uh, a big meteorite exploded in the air and it was traveling at like a 35 degree angle 
and it talks about how if it exploded in the air at a certain height, then what you would end up with is with the the momentum of all that material, you end up with a fire plume traveling down a superheated, yeah, superheated plume of gas and fragments of material that reach the earth. And so you you literally get fire raining down from heaven or this this superheated gas and the materials coming down and it would be glowing like fire because of how hot it would be um yeah so there you go the bible predicts that there's this city there destroyed by fire from heaven and based on that you know there's no proof no one could have made this no one no they couldn't have written the bible based off this like change the Bible because it was 2,000 years ago that we have it in the Dead Sea Scrolls that this occurred, and um, and the area has uh, been covered by other people who've built over it. But it's just recently, you know, in the last two decades, about people have gone and dug down and found discovered this city destroyed by a meteorite strike. So I think that is um, amazing proof that you know even some of this stuff in the Book of Genesis where it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed by fire, we literally have Sodom in the place it's supposed to be, a city here destroyed by fire from heaven. So there you go. I went on a long time about that. I hope you can appreciate how amazing that is to have this uh, verification that this story, which seems so tremendous, like what a crazy miracle for God to do to send fire down from heaven to destroy a city. But we literally have this, this evidence here. Now, some people would say, you'll see some of these articles that maybe um, maybe the biblical stories of the city being destroyed were inspired by the meteor that the meteorite happened and they you know they're coming from a perfect per perspective of not believing in God that the fire came down just destroyed these cities and then that's what inspired people at that time you know 3,000 plus years ago to say oh well that must have been God destroying the cities, and then they wrote it into the Bible. But either way, it proves that what is written in the Bible wasn't just made up recently. It was written at that time because those people who were there saw this city that was destroyed by the fire from heaven. Okay, that's the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, this document here with basically my study notes on this. I'm going to link it in the video so you can just go through the document yourself if you want to read it in more detail. Um, take your time. Click through all these things that I have linked in here. Um, here's another evidence. Well, I'll just say evidence number two. That was evidence number one. We'll call this one evidence number two. So sanitary practices. Do you guys know the story of Ignaz Semmelweis? So, or some people say Semmelweis. Basically, he's a guy who he believed, and it was new at the time, he put forth the idea that, well, maybe the disease-causing agent that causes childbirth fever and causes all these mothers to die following childbirth, maybe it's, trans maybe it's transmitted by our hands. And maybe if we washed our hands, we could help prevent this. Um, now, Ignaz Semmelweis, he was just a more recent guy uh, to live. You know, you think around the time of Louis Pasteur and all these people um, where the germ theory of disease was just coming forth in the world. Now, um, Ignaz Semmelweis, he was, uh, he watched, there were these two clinics where mothers could go in the same city to have their children, have their babies delivered. And in one place, there were midwives that did the deliveries. In another place, there were doctors that did the, the deliveries. And the doctors, the doctors would, actually also do autopsies there studying people who had died to try and figure out the cause of death and they would go from performing autopsies and working in the gangrenous bodies and go straight to delivering children and they sometimes wouldn't even wash their hands doesn't that seem bizarre to you today but that's what would happen and not surprisingly to us the rates of mothers dying following childbirth were extremely high in that hospital you know i have to look at the data again you can look it up but it's something insane you're just like it breaks your heart that such a high proportion of mothers who would have their children would die um, and the rate was much lower among the midwives and Ignaz Semmelweis went to uh, study it and he saw that the the midwives in this other clinic they washed their hands and the doctors did not wash their hands 
And so he puts forth this study and he's really angry about it. He's really passionate, of course, because people are dying. And he just kind of hammers down against those doctors. And it makes a lot of people angry at him. And so they actually got him put in an insane, insane asylum. And that's where he died. He died in an insane asylum for teaching that people should wash their hands. Um, now, here's a, here's a little bit from President Nelson's talk called Where is Wisdom? given in October 1992. Um, and so President Nelson says, Mankind's unfamiliarity with the scriptures has sometimes brought sorrow to great numbers of people over long periods of time. The suffering that has resulted from such ignorance is truly tragic. May I illustrate with excerpts from history that pertain to the spread of infection. In the 19th century, health officials and others were concerned about pollution of the air, not by visible smoggy hydrocarbons of today, but by an invisible miasma that was blamed for almost any infection. In 1867, for example, Lord Lister indicated um, that bad air uh, in indicted or indicted bad air as the chief cause of infection. After that, in 1869, Simpson from Edinburgh urged that hospitals be taken down and rebuilt every few years. Such an extravagant practice was also advocated by other experts, right? They'd literally take down hospitals and rebuild them just to get rid of this bad air because they believed in the four humors theory that had been put forth a long time ago. Anyway, even Florence Nightingale, a living legend following her heroic efforts in the Crimean War, failed to recognize the transmission of infection from one patient to another. This, despite her careful notations that wound infection accounted for 40% of post-operative mortality. 40% of people dying after their surgeries, it was from wound infections. So, yeah, they weren't doing the surgeries cleanly and in a sterile way. Uh, he says, President Nelson says, but others missed the connection too. For centuries, lives of innumerable mothers and children were claimed by childbirth fever infections unknowingly transmitted among the innocent but unwashed hands of attendants. It was only a short century ago that the great work of Coach, Pasteur, and others proved that infection could be caused by bacteria in contaminated body fluids or infected issues passed from one individual to another. With these highlights of history in mind, may I quote the word of the Lord recorded long ago in Leviticus chapter 15. The Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, because of his issue he is unclean, and this shall be his uncleanness in his issue. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean, and every thing whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. And he that toucheth the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. Leviticus 15. Several verses follow which re-emphasize and illustrate those important principles. Then we read this conclusion. And when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in running water and shall be clean. Right? So it's, it says that... The person who had the issue, when they're healed, they should wash themselves and all their, their clothes that could have been contaminated. It also says anyone that touches the person in his bed or just touches his bed even without him in it, they, that person needs to wash their clothes and bathe themselves, right? So this washing yourself and your clothes and any contaminated thing, that's how you become clean. And that's what God told them in Leviticus chapter 15. And so if people had just followed the advice in Leviticus chapter 15, it would have helped so much with these medical problems and with childbirth fever and infections or Laura Florence Nightingale with people having infections transmitted from patient to patient. If after they touched someone who was unclean, they just washed themselves in their clothes, they would prevent so much transmission of infection. So that's an example where this advice given through prophetic authority all the way back in the Old Testament shows that God was revealing something to, the, something to those people that was true, that was not even discovered to medical knowledge until, you know, 3,000 years later. 
or something like that. I don't know the exact time periods. I'm just coming up with that right now. Okay, guys, so that'll be the end of episode one. I'm going to break it up into multiple episodes because otherwise it's going to be very long, and I have received feedback from some people that they would enjoy shorter, more bite-sized videos. So there's several more points. Um, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah and the amazing discovery of that place, verifying the biblical account as true. Um, and we talked about God's counsel on handling issues of the flesh and diseases and how we need to wash ourselves and the bedding and our clothing after being around those people. In the future videos, we're going to talk about some more very amazing things, confirming um, the truthfulness of the restored gospel as well and revelations through Joseph Smith. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to dive into them. I'll make the videos in the next couple days. I'm also preparing for an exam that's real big and kind of stressful. I've been kind of under the weather, so just trying to get these videos out as I can make them. Um, and I appreciate um, your patience, willingness to watch a video here that, you know, I just screen recorded myself talking. That's a lot more efficient for me to do, talking through my notes and, and just expressing those things. It'll reduce the amount of time it takes for me to make a video, um, and it'll allow me to make more content more easily, um, even though you won't see me expressing it and then cutting back and forth between my notes. Um, it's just going to be a lot more efficient. So I hope this video was helpful for you. Please share these evidences with people you know because it's good for them to know that um, it's not just the people who who dislike religion, who, who, who don't like religion, who have evidence to use on their arguments because there's so much evidence. And anyway, you're going to see in these upcoming videos. It's going to be so cool. So I leave you my testimony that I have had my own experiences with God and... The gospel is true, and there's so much evidence that Jesus Christ walked the earth. Not just in the Bible. There are other people who wrote about Jesus Christ, um, which we'll get into. Um, and you, too, can know by the Spirit bearing witnesses to, witness to you that it's true, which is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Um, but yeah, until next time, see ya.